1982, the Moon. A small force of armored troop transports crawl along the lunar surface. The vehicles are limited to only two dozen miles an hour at maximum. Any faster and the next bump could send the vehicle and its crew flying hundreds of feet in the reduced gravity. The lumbering APCs clear a crater and suddenly come into view of their objective, a Soviet lunar outpost on the dark side of the moon. Immediately upon clearing the crater's rim, the APCs come under fire from Soviet laser cannons, but the American vehicles are coated in a highly reflective outer shell that reflects much of the incoming laser energy. The powerful defensive lasers eventually burn through the protective shell, but it's been built in layers, granting each vehicle a few minutes protection from the withering laser energy. The vehicles launch several dozen canisters into the air above the Soviet base. Laser fire incinerates many of the canisters, but a dozen and a half survive. Lofted in a high trajectory over the base, an explosive charge propels a shower of razor-sharp spikes down onto the moon base, as the canister is knocked out into orbit by the force of the explosion. The rain of deadly missiles does nothing to penetrate the Soviet base itself, buried under a few feet of lunar soil. But for the Soviet troops and laser batteries caught out in the open, the attack is deadly. The small projectile tear through the equipment and rip open men's suits, exposing them to the freezing vacuum of space. As the vehicles near the lunar outpost, though, it's time for payback. The first vehicle to hit a landmine disappears in a massive plume of dust. A second and then a third quickly follow. These aren't ordinary landmines, though. Here on the moon, high explosives are extremely rare. In the reduced lunar gravity, even a moderately sized explosion could send lethal debris into orbit, or raining down dozens of miles away, killing and destroying friendly forces and installations. Instead of a conventional explosive, these landmines are really nothing more than tiny rocket mortars. Attached to a stabilizing plate, the mines are triggered as a vehicle rolls over it, which activates the rocket mortar which in turn drives the plate into the vehicle from below. With a sixth of the gravity of Earth, the small rocket mortar at the bottom of the plate has more than enough force to send an armored vehicle hundreds of feet upward. Since the mines rarely hit center mass, the vehicles are sent in wild, parabolic trajectories that are inevitably lethal to the crews inside. One American APC takes a Soviet mine in the front half of its body, sending it 300 feet upwards in a trajectory that will see it smash into a crater wall at dozens of meters a second, over three miles away. Only half of the APCs make it through the minefield and laser fire, and the troops inside quickly disembark. Instead of traditional EVA suits, though, these men are wearing special spacesuits that are still technically in the prototype phase. Traditional EVA suits are filled with breathable gases and pressurized to something close to Earth normal, making each individual look like a miniature Stay puff Marshmallow Man. This severely limits individual mobility and is a massive liability as soldiers are vulnerable to punctures and tears that would depressurize their suits and compromise their air supply. Perhaps as frightening is losing one's air supply, though, is what would happen to the body in an unpressurized environment. As the pressure of the gases inside the body exceed exterior pressure, the body would begin to swell and expand, causing severe pain and possibly rupturing organs. Water inside the body would soon begin to boil, causing further disastrous consequences. To aid in mobility and prevent the dangers of decompression, each soldier is equipped with a skin-tight suit that maintains a healthy pressure environment for the body via mechanical pressure. The suits are custom-made for each individual, as a tiny deviation in manufacture would mean disastrous consequences for that soldier and take a long time to don and doff but offer incredibly increased mobility and survivability over normal pressurized suits. They also allow the wearing of additional armor plating without too adversely affecting a soldier's mobility, while traditional blow-up suits are simply too rigid already to bother with adding much armor. The much lower gravity of the moon also helps maintain mobility even with 24 pounds of ceramic armor plates over most of the body. Today's US space soldier looks more like a futuristic knight than a modern infantryman. The vulnerable air supply is worn as a backpack, and it, along with the hoses connecting to the helmet, are armored slightly more than the rest of the suit. But all this armor isn't to protect from bullets, as the Americans quickly find out from surviving Soviet defenders. Each Soviet is equipped with one of two variations of space guns. The first looks like a typical submachine gun from back here on Earth, but is anything but. Firstly, it doesn't use nearly as much gunpowder as a gun on Earth would. With a sixth the gravity, that much recoil would send a soldier flying backward with their first trigger pull. Instead, each bullet has less than a tenth of the gunpowder of a normal bullet, and yet despite this still reaches velocities upwards of 3,000 to 4,000 feet per second, as much as 1,000 feet per second faster than a 7.62 round here on Earth. 
but that much powder comes with a price, and automatic fire is impossible in such low gravity. Instead, the firing soldier must carefully line up each individual shot before firing, taking the time to re-steady themselves before each shot. The gun is best for long-range engagements, and the Americans are rapidly closing the distance with their nimble combat suits. At closer range, the Soviets switch to a different weapon. This one also has a long barrel, but the magazines are actually attached directly to the sides of the barrel itself. The dual magazines need to be physically manipulated to push a long, razor-sharp dart into the chamber. Then a gas cartridge inserted into the butt of the weapon is activated with a firing trigger, causing it to propel the dart out of the weapon at several hundred feet a second. The weapon resembles a more modern version of a crossbow than a Buck Rogers space gun, but is deadly effective in the low gravity and zero atmosphere environment of the moon, giving an incredible range and accuracy. Unlike on Earth, in space there is no atmospheric friction or other effects to act on a projectile, so space guns are incredibly accurate. The only thing limiting the accuracy of each weapon is the difficulty in taking a proper firing stance when bracing against the recoil and bringing the weapon's sights up to a shooter's eyes through the bulky spacesuit. But the Americans have their own answer to the lack of accuracy, and it's not just their much sleeker ergonomic spacesuits. As an American soldier vaults into a Soviet trench in the lunar gravity, he flips forward a strange tube mounted on his shoulder and presses a lever on the side. The shoulder-mounted weapon is, like most other space weapons, made out of plastic and various composites, as regular metal or wood would be impossible to operate on the moon. For starters, the extreme temperatures ranging from 260 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 280 degrees wreak havoc on normal weapon materials, and the intense heating could cause ammunition to simply explode. Even if a metal weapon survives the extreme temperatures, the metal components would inevitably fuse together in the vacuum of space. This is known as cold welding, and happens when two similar metals are brought into contact with each other and their molecules mix together. Here on Earth, a layer of oxidization prevents it from happening, but in space that layer eventually wears off. If these weren't enough challenges for a gunsmith to overcome, there's also the fact that lubricants in space tend to evaporate in the absence of an atmosphere. That means the American shoulder-mounted weapon, just like any other space weapon, is made up of plastic and other composites, and operates via recoil rather than gas like on Earth. But this weapon is slightly different from the others the Soviets have faced so far. As soon as the American Astro soldier presses the firing mechanism on the side of the strange cylinder, a tiny charge of gas expels three dozen darts about an inch long. The darts are expelled at a modest 6 meters a second, but upon firing, a charge at the rear of each dart is ignited. Exactly half a second later, with the darts now 3 meters away from the shooter, each charge explodes, propelling the darts forward with terrible velocity. The weapon is the equivalent of a space shotgun, and is meant to shower a small area with high-speed flechettes. To avoid sending the firing soldier flying backwards and possibly into lunar orbit from the explosive recoil, each round is designed to be accelerated out of the barrel of the gun with a small gas charge, while the actual propellant charge is ignited and calculated to burn for half a second before exploding well clear of the shooter. The gun isn't very accurate, but it doesn't need to be. The lethal shower of flechettes means instant death out to a range of 100 or more meters, one reason why the weapon cannot be fired with any friendlies in the line of sight. Now that the fighting is in the lunar trenches, though, the Soviets bring out their own close quarters weapons. A Soviet soldier lifts up his personal sidearm to defend himself, and the weapon looks almost ridiculously dainty and fragile. The weapon has a long, very thin barrel, slightly longer than a revolver, and a top-mounted magazine. The magazine feeds the weapon with a dozen razor-sharp darts, just over two inches long, and these are propelled by a gas canister housed within the grip of the strange pistol itself. The gas-operated weapon suffers from the same recoil issues as any space gun, but its smaller size means the Soviet soldier is able to reacquire his target much faster. Even with just a modest blast of gas, the lack of atmospheric friction and low gravity means that each dart is still sped up to velocities similar to those of normal bullets back on Earth. Some of the weapons don't even use gas at all, but are operated by a spring which is cocked manually before each firing. Instead of darts, they fire ceramic pellets, and reach the same speed and lethality as a 22 back here on Earth. In space, though, the best close quarters weapon is the same as it's been back on Earth for a thousand years. And as the fighting drags on, the fancy space guns are quickly discarded after running out of darts, pellets, or flechettes, or gas. Now the fighting is done hand to hand with razor sharp knives made out of tough ceramic. But here on the moon, even a tiny cut can be immediately lethal. The American suits, with their mechanical pressure, are better able to handle punctures and tears. But first aid in a space environment is practically non existent. If a wounded individual doesn't have their wound immediately and thoroughly sealed, it doesn't matter if the rest of their suit maintains integrity, the vacuum of space will draw out all liquids it can through the wound very rapidly, turning even a minor stab into a critical injury. At last, the fighting draws to a close, the American troops stand victorious. They've lost over half their numbers, but they have succeeded in eliminating the Soviet position and securing the
the Lunar Outpost. Any remaining troops left inside the outpost's buildings will either surrender or simply be left to asphyxiate as the outer shell of each building is purposefully breached and the atmosphere vented. But victory is short-lived, and suddenly on the horizon is the telltale plume of decelerating spacecraft. The Americans quickly rush to take up their own defensive positions. Soviet reinforcements are on the way. Thanks to low gravity, it's easy and fast to move troops around via pod-like craft that detach from an orbiting ship's main body. And with a low enough orbit, a ship can orbit the moon every two and a half hours. That time frame can be shrunk even further for faster orbits and thus faster response. But it comes at the risk of flying at a lower, faster orbit and being more vulnerable the ground fire. Orbital mechanics are very much in the minds of the surviving American troops as they watch the deceleration plumes of the incoming drop pods, as calculating altitude and speed will not just let them know how long until they're once more under fire, but exactly where each drop pod will land. Maybe, just maybe, if they manage to ambush one or two of the incoming pods, they may have a chance of seeing home again and breathing in real air once more. Now go check out What If There Were Wars In Space, or click this other video instead. Another settlement needs your help.